Picture this, if you will. You're a primary care physician seeing a 35-year-old obese male who smokes a pack of cigarettes per day for the first time in clinic. He has no medical complaints, a completely normal physical exam, and his lab work is picture perfect. But you tell him that he really should quit smoking, and he nods his head a little impatiently. He knows about the health risks, but it's just too stressful at work right now to take on the additional burden of quitting. You mention his weight, and he looks a little surprised. I thought you said my lab work was fine, he says. Look, believe me, I'm great with the ladies. A couple extra pounds never hurt my chances, he laughs. You consider how to effectively respond to your patient in a way that most effectively encourages him to follow the lifestyle changes you recommend. By the end of this episode, you'll be able to 1. Broadly define the trans-theoretical model of change. 2. List the five or six stages of the trans-theoretical model of change. 3. Explain how clinicians can make use of this model in terms of approaching patients in different stages. Recognize that there's a pre-contemplation stage and explain the obligations and limitations of a clinician interviewing during this stage. Finally, recognize the need for maintenance of change. The trans-theoretical model of change is a model of behavior change, originally conceived of as a way to understand how patients overcome addiction. But it can be a helpful framework for clinicians to address behavior change for any problematic behavior, or even to develop a positive habit like a better diet or dental hygiene. <laughs> My dentist has been trying to get me to floss for years, and I still don't do it because apparently I'm gross. And let's be real, as a grown adult, do you really want a lecture from your primary care doctor every time you're in his office? It's a tough line to walk between genuinely looking out for your patient's health and telling a grown adult what to do. But a good way to broach the subject is to see if they're even ready to make a change. This way, you're putting the ball in their court. A lot of your patients will be in a state of what's known as pre-contemplation, meaning that they haven't even contemplated the idea of quitting because to them, it's not a problem. At this point, it's kind of your job to educate them that yes, it is a problem from a health standpoint. And they may disagree, but hey, at least you gave them a fair warning. Let them know that you're there for them if they want to talk more, but pushing it much beyond that is only going to convince your patients that you're trying to act like their mom, and they're not going to listen. The road to recovery really starts with contemplation. Recognizing that there is a problem in the first place, but for whatever reason or another, these patients aren't yet ready or willing to make a plan. And as grown adults, you have to respect that decision. But keep checking back with them in future appointments. Keep pitching the benefits of behavior change and suggesting how they might go about it. If they're trying to quit smoking, you can mention that you can also prescribe them varenicline to help with the symptoms, for example. Because there's nothing patients like hearing more than there's a pill that'll help solve their problems. Eventually, you want them to make a commitment to change, which leads them into the determination, or preparation stage. This is where they resolve to do something about their problem, making a plan to address it, and darn it, you're going to do everything in your power to make that happen. For your smokers, get them started on a medication that'll help with their cravings. Get them on a schedule to cut down their use gradually instead of going cold turkey. Schedule regular check-ins, have backup plans, you know, all that good stuff. And once you've set some reasonable goals together, they begin on their action plan, where they're slowly but surely changing their ways. And here's the important part. The change requires maintenance. Early on, reinforce strategies that allow your patients to be self-sufficient in sustaining their action and maintenance plans. Be realistic with them about how difficult it's going to continue to be, and teach them coping strategies for those challenges. Encourage them to avoid environments that led them to the problematic behavior in the first place, because as any smoker knows, without constant attention and effort, you can easily relapse back into the old patterns of behavior generally returning to the contemplative stage of change. If a relapse occurs, though, it's important to share with your patient that relapse is common, and it may take a couple of relapses to achieve lasting maintenance. So that describes the trans-theoretical model of change. It's important to know that, like a lot of things in psychology, it's not universal, and it's not even particularly well-validated. But it does serve as a reasonable framework to begin understanding the frame of your mind that your patients are in, and how to approach encouraging changes in behavior. Because almost all of us are going to need to get good at this at some point if we want to be successful physicians. 
especially primary care doctors who probably say the words diet and exercise to 10 different patients a day. And if you don't understand where your patients are in the process of change, then diet and exercise are just words you say, so you can check that box off on your good doctor checklist. If you actually want your patients to make the change you're suggesting, you need to adapt your strategy to the stage of change that they're in. All right, flash quiz time. Between which two stages of change does the commitment to changing behavior occur? And the answer is between the stages of contemplation and preparation or determination. When it comes to the trans theoretical model of change, here's the bottom line. The trans theoretical model of change describes the stages of changing one's behavior and proposes strategies for clinicians to support and reinforce the change. To progress from pre-contemplation to contemplation requires acknowledging that there is a problem requiring behavior change. A commitment to changing one's behavior leads to the preparation determination and eventually the action willpower stage. Finally, maintenance of the change is required to help prevent relapse. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, guys. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up down below if you like what you heard. And remember, comments are more than welcome. Also remember that this stuff may not be the highest yield for step one, but for most of you, this will become a part of the art of medicine that distinguishes the great doctors from those that are merely adequate. Because most likely, 99% of your patient's time will be spent outside the clinic or hospital, and the more you can effectively influence their behavior and choices on the outside, the more likely you are to see the positive health benefits when they see you for your next appointment.